of the Dhaka initiation. So today is going to be a deep day. It's going to be healing the connection from the heart and the lingam. It's a lingam day today. And we spent a few days worshipping the divine feminine, the goddess energy, <clears throat> helping her heal. And as a man, <clears throat> we are taught to be strong, to be solid, to be providers, protectors. And we're meant to have all our shit together. Now, we also need healing. There's a whole process around healing our connection with our heart and our lingam. And I think the best way to describe this is just to tell you a story, to tell you my story. My first memory that I have is when I was four years old and these strangers came into my house. They were pretty fancy, so my parents got the fancy cutlery out. We weren't very rich back then. And um, we didn't know who they were. And one by one, each, each boy, there's three of us, uh, went upstairs. And I, I went up and, um, and they told me to take my trousers down. I was like, this is weird. And then they pinned me down and they cut off the top of my foreskin without my consent. It was horrific. And I wriggled, wriggled around and like I tried to get out. And that was my first memory. The second memory was um, climbing up my brother's stairs and finding these comic books and X-Men, uh, Wolverine was in it. And I was like, oh, cool. So somehow these two moments really affected my life. I um, always felt like the outsider, a bit like the X-Men. And, um, and I was gently mutilated. And I didn't know that I started drinking and taking drugs because of my body shame. I didn't know that I was so ashamed of my, my lingam. Now the word lingam means the shaft of light, uh, the older Sanskrit word for your conscious cock. And it was once seen as a healing tool. And when I discovered this, I was like, I can't heal any of our dicks. It's, a, it's, it's, it's women's vaginas that heal us. This is what we've been told. And um, turns out to be another misleading bit of information around the woke community and the spiritual community. It's like, yes, my job was to worship women, but no one really learned about worshiping the Lingam. Now in another culture, the Hindu culture, they, they worship the Shiva Lingam. And now this is this uh, big dome structure with a vessel and something that falls out. It's meant to represent the Lingam and the Yoni. Now, different religions, different cultures will say different things. Everyone is going to say different, different things. So it's up to you to decide what you want to believe in. And when I saw this, I was like, huh, people worship Shiva's dick. Is that, is that, is that what I'm reading into this? That's what I took anyway. But it's up to you to discover what it is and what it really means. Um, we're taught something different. But I knew that I needed to heal this connection. I didn't know subconsciously how much it affected every aspect of my life. I didn't know that I became an alcoholic and a drug addict because I was so afraid of my dick, of it being judged that I needed to turn off the lights, be drunk, and so no one could ever see my penis. So like, they'll have it inside them or in their mouth, but they would never see it. I, like Wolverine, I'm really good at adapting. And that was one of my actual qualities I found out about myself, which is I'm a survivor. I've had a lot of fucked up shit happened and I've adapted and I've survived. When I was 19, I wanted to have a girlfriend. I wanted to lose my virginity to somebody that I trusted and loved. So my first ever girlfriend was somebody that I trusted and she was my best friend at the time. And she and I had sex on April the 1st, 1999. And that was my first sexual experience with somebody that I loved. Luckily, that gave me a good imprint. And I'm one of the rare few men and humans on the planet that only sleeps with 
his friends. Like I only only fuck my friends. That's it. <laughs> like, that's uh, I found that the simplest solution for my um, my lingam, my my issue with my dick. So if I sleep with my friends, they're not going to judge me. So I I managed to navigate life, not knowing the effects of this. Now being an alcoholic and a drug addict is a problem. It's a huge problem. Like I was on a kidney, I was almost on a kidney dialysis machine when I was 26. Had a liver damage when I was 33. Uh, both times I was told I wasn't gonna uh, be living for much longer if I carried on. I can't get life insurance anymore because of my medical records. Like it really affected me. And I, of course I lost a lot of friends because I was, I was, I was a mess. So, again, I didn't know the root of my problems. When I discovered Tantra, which was 2014, just a year after the, the, the liver damage, I mean, now I had kidney damage and liver damage. I made a full recovery, so I started drinking again. Like, I had no reason to stop. I couldn't stop. Everything I was getting from drinking was the human connection I was longing for. Like the only reason why I drank was to connect with women so I could, like, my job was actually to make out with hundreds and thousands of people. It was great. Seven years being a unicorn, and that was our role, to, to spread the sparkle and make everyone feel sexy and juicy and just have a great time. We were like party fluffers. I was also a uh, erotic artist. I was working at sex parties uh, with my troop of unicorns. So we're, I was always very sex positive, but it was unconscious. I was drunk all the time. 2014, I was at Burning Man and I couldn't get drunk anymore. I was working, I used to be at a sound camp called Bubbles and Bass and I had a great time there. Sunrise champagnes, collecting all the people, hottest people, making out with everyone and then being like everybody's spirit guide and taking everybody across the playa and giving them the most mystical, magical experiences. Like a thing like social anxiety, lack of confidence doesn't exist when you're shit-faced. I'm the most fun person. If you've ever seen a um, Friends series with the episodes of uh, Fun Bobby in it, I was Fun Bobby. <laughs> Take away the alcohol, then I, well, that's actually what happened. At Burning Man nine years ago, I just couldn't get drunk anymore. And I, and I was like, I can't get drunk anymore. Nothing's working. And for some reason, my body wouldn't absorb the alcohol, and I just couldn't get drunk. When your whole identity, and when you've been an addict since 1993, your superhuman abilities don't work anymore, you start to panic and freak out. And, and I remember going across the playa, everyone's shit face, everyone's having a great time. And I'm like, who am I? <laughs> and I had to go back to work. I was working at Fox TV. I was working at, in advertising. I had a great career, I had a great house, a couple of houses, two houses in London. I did the classic rags to riches story of being jobless, homeless and suicidal to building a really nice life for myself. A life built on trauma, which I didn't know about. Uh, addiction, again, I didn't know about. And drama, drama-fueled relationships. Again, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of any of this. I didn't have that moment in my time where I could just like look back at, at what I've done. I was just, the camera was just facing this way and I was going. So when I stopped drinking, I had to tackle a lot of stuff. All these random things started happening. I started seeing visions when I was making love. I would hear voices. I didn't know what those voices were. People around me were having this mental breakdown around me as well. It wasn't just me. There's a few of us during October 2014. We were all going batshit crazy. A lot of them got sectioned and got taken to the doctors by their loving parents and prescribed... Uh, pills. They're still on the pills to this day because I still talk to some of them. Um, I, I had friends who were burners and I was like, guys, weird things happening. Every time I have sex, I have these hallucinations and it's super weird. And some people would say, wow, it sounds like your shaman body's been activated. Your, your light body's been activated. I'm like, 
sounds fucking awesome. Light body, shaman body, your kundalini is being active, kundalini. So now I'm like hearing all these things I'm make, that, that's making me sound like a superhuman. Finally, I could be like Wolverine. I mean, already in that period of my life, I was dressing up as a superhero every other day, dressed as a unicorn. I had like a gang of unicorns as well. So it's like, it's just adding more to my, my fantasy world, which was actually a global movement as well. So I was having this mental breakdown and a TV company started filming me whilst I was going through this crisis moment in my life. So if anyone's had like this awakening, your first spiritual awakening, you're going batshit crazy. Now imagine a TV crew following you around for one year whilst you're going batshit crazy. That's what I went through. <laughs> so they would, they bought into the idea of, wow, hedonistic polyamorous unicorn, yay. A charismatic leader, this is so much fun. And then when they start filming, I come back from Burning Man and then, then I'm not, like I'm not that guy anymore. I can't drink anymore. So they end up filming me for one year being a complete mess. And they put it out and I was famous for being a failure. Now this was one of the biggest um, vice documentaries they've ever done that has had the most amount of exposure. It got into like highbrow newspapers as a, as a pretty good documentary. For me, obviously, I was portrayed as a, as a dick. It's like, it's terrible, it's a disaster for me. But for everybody watching it, because obviously I'm, I'm like, oh, this is a failure. They were meant to film this and this, and now I'm going batshit crazy. Now it's on. Um, I forgot about it, to be honest. I just carried on with my life because what actually happened was people in the streets would stop me and go, hey, can I take a selfie of you? I, I, I love that documentary. I'm like, sure thing. Um, and then pretty much every day, people come up to me and thank me for being so vulnerable. Now, I don't know what the word vulnerable means at this point in my life, uh, for being so vulnerable and authentic. Again, I don't know what these words mean. They're not in my vocabulary. And uh, sharing my story to inspire other people to step into their vulnerability. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And at the very end of that documentary, you see me going to my first ever tantra workshop. And I come back dressed as a woman, as my inner feminine. Uh, Shakita Squirt Miller Islam is my inner feminine's name and I do a thing called Tantra. So that documentary literally shows me going batshit crazy, doing a thing called Tantra and stepping into my inner feminine and, the, and, and it ends. A few years later, <clears throat> I go down a rabbit hole of Tantra because of that one training. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what happened there. And then I got really into Tantra and I became a fully enlightened Tantric sex guru. And that, was my greatest comeback. So from being batshit crazy, from being an actual guru, and everything's documented on my YouTube channel. So I wanted to share my process of not being well at all, to going on my tantric journey, and I filmed everything, everything's in my vlogs, and going all the way to like all the trainings from Ista to Agama. I, I've done a lot of Agama videos. Layla Martin is a, a, an Agama graduate as well. Like I did all the trainings with all the gurus that you could ever possibly do during the golden age of Tantra. And, and then, I, then I did my documentary. And my mission was to get more sexy people to do Tantra. So what happened in that, um, that first Tantric experience was I had to get naked like this was one of the biggest sex cults in the world at the time and when it came to sex cults I was like I want to be a part of it because I'm sober and I've got social anxiety if there's vaginas being touched in a sacred setting like oming so that was my first thing and everyone said, don't do oming because it's a sex cult. I was like, I'll go and do oming. Um, it's a heavily monetized com company. Like you have to buy lube for like $20 or something. And it's, you've got to have these late, it's an interesting structure. And I, I went there and I still had social anxiety, even after 
do these orgasmic meditations. And for me, it's, it's just weird. There is a documentary on Netflix called Orgasmic Inc. And they've heavily dramatized it. And it is one, like, you know, she's being taken down by the FBI. Um, and then I went to another one, which I can't mention. And that was the one that changed my life. And they do get you to do outrageous um, sexual practices. Outrageous, outrageous. And funnily enough, everything the main guru said came true. He said, you'll start to find people you're not into attractive. Uh, you'll become polyamorous and bisexual. I was like, that's not going to happen to me. Because I used to identify myself as a lesbian. Now that means that, again, Tantra showed me why I was so in my feminine. It's because I had a violent, absent father who beat the shit out of me, so I disowned my masculinity, felt more safe with women, and became hypersensitive around energy, so I didn't, wouldn't you know, upset my father. And I, I just was raised by my mom and raised by the women and had friends, especially during university and um, after university and everything. Um, they were just women. They were my best friends. Even during high school, uh, my, my best friend was a woman. So I always had that. So I naturally picked up feminine traits. If you're going to be surrounded by really jacked people, you'll be the next jacked person. If you're surrounded just by women, you're just going to be more like a woman. So everyone throughout my life just thought I was gay. And then someone like Russell Brand and Noel Fielding came into the world and Eddie Izzard, so it made it more acceptable for me to be who I am. Then I went to Burning Man, and the more fabulous you are, the more in your feminine you are, the more you have sex. I was like able to be my full self. And then I discovered Tantra, and there's a lot of explanation to why I was the way I was. When I went to this tantric uh, workshop it was known as a sex cult they were very proud actually they said we are the world's number one sex cult welcome i was like wow this is this is great after doing uh level one and doing a lot of sexual um rituals very extreme um the next one we the, the level two we all had to get naked in front of each other and I was like, I'm not going to get naked. Now, I've never been naked in public. Because of my genital mutilation in the locker rooms, I would never get naked. In the onsens in Japan, I would never get naked. Saunas, forget about it. Steam rooms, forget about it. Um, swimming pools, I would hide a towel. And I had a, you know, again, I adapted. So no one ever would see my lingam. And and I wasn't going to get naked. Everyone was already 60 people naked in a circle, including, including the, no, he wasn't naked. Um, I was the only one who just refused. And he said, what's going on? And he never disobeyed the guru. So I was like, I, I have this genital mutilation. He said, look, come here. And uh, there's a big circle, 60 people. And I went up to the cult leader and he said, Go up to that woman, get your cock out, and ask her what she thinks of your cock. I was like, okay. And got my dick out, and it was in Sweden, and it's cold. <laughs> so I was like, what do you think of my dick? And she said, you have a beautiful cock. I was like, oh, okay. And then she, he said, can you uh, ask the next person? And it was a dude. I was like, what do you think of my dick? And he said, you have a beautiful penis. I was like, oh. Thank you. And I had to go around 60 times getting external validation from r people that I shared this course with. And by the, and this was a long process. This is 60 people. What do you think of my dick? 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 What do you, it's like, it's a, it's a huge, and I, and I don't like taking up time. <laughs> Believe it or not, I don't like taking up space even though I'm a performer. So um, at the end of it, when I came back to the same woman, he said, look, come over here. Let me have, let me have a look at your dick. So I got my dick. It was already out because I was like shuffling around with it. Um, he said, look, I've got the same free scarring as you. 
and he got his dick out and I was like, oh, we're dick twins and we literally high-fived each other with our dicks. <laughs> and from that moment, because of the guru having the same dick as me, I, um, I never had that problem ever again. And it's just in that outrageous moment defined the rest of my life, this adult life, this awakening. He activated my Kundalini. He, he showed us how to be multi-orgasmic as men. He showed us how to injaculate. And we would have just incredible sexual experiences that was just so insane. Like, I, I've seen things that are the most craziest things I've ever seen. I've, I've actually done more crazier things than ever now. But one of the weirdest things I saw was, well, Firstly, I was able to make someone squirt without penetration, just through my energy. Now, we all know that we have the Anubis and there's physical things you've got to do to release the Amrita, but through energy, squirting, that's, I, I, I've never seen it since, and it just happened in that container. There was a DJ uh, who is very in tune with, he was like creating the atmosphere of the whole process. There was a woman, um, she had a blindfold on and she was just, she was there and he would get the energy from the base, channel it through him and energetically put it into her vagina. She's blindfolded and like she obviously can't see this movement. I can and every time he's doing that, she's convulsing and orgasming. It was literally like being in like the danger room in X-Men. It was crazy, but it was one of like, it's, it, it, my mind was blown. My body was awakened. And ever since then, during the time after, I was able to like understand what this stuff was happening, like all this stuff was happening to me. Um, like if I was inside of someone, I would tense my body and I would see her turn blue and all this electricity would flow through her body and these giant angel wings would come out of the back of her back. Of her back. And um, we'd have a sharing afterwards and she would say, wow, there's this moment where I felt all this electricity go through me. I was like, hang on, did you have explosions coming out of your back? She said, yes, how did you know? It's like, I saw that. And then more weirder stuff would happen where I would just like, feel all this color coming out of my hands and I would see rainbow energy going through like another lover and she would say wow I saw these colors like flashing in front of my eyes I was like that was the thing I was doing so it's too unusual for me to put it off and it's too consistent and unusual to put it off to chance and grace and randomness and I was sober so I went deep into the tantric path because all this cool stuff was happening, but also I kept on meeting these amazing, beautiful women who were super young, super agile, super sexy. And when I would look at them in the eyes, they looked a little bit different. And I would ask them how old they are. And they would say, we're 60 years old. I was like, what are you doing? And they said, we are Dakinis. I was like, you've clearly found the fountain of youth. What the fuck is a Dakini? And what are you doing? I want it. And the same word came up over and over again, Tantra, 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 Tantra. So for me, I had enough proof that Tantra gave you something. There's so much stuff happening inside of me that I knew something was going on. And it was supernatural. Like it was literally like having superhuman abilities. Then it turns out that these superhuman abilities are known as cities. And all this um, energy in your body is called ujas, and it's all very uh, real in Hindu texts. Like, it's, it's, it's in their religion. I was like, oh, okay, right. This is a thing. So, when I connected to my lingam, when I learned to accept my lingam, more and more people wanted my lingam inside of them. Now, that's an interesting side effect. Now I had another reference point around that as well. I think I was like 28 and, and I really liked this girl. And I was like, 
talking to my female friends. You know how girls talk about boys? Well, they, that's, that's, what, that's my favorite thing. So um, I was talking about this girl, I was going, oh, I don't think she'll ever like me. I'm not, and I was like saying how unworthy I was. I'm not a success or anything. And then a friend of mine said, Shaf, you are a success. Look, you've got two, you got one house in London. You're on like 60K a year. You've done all this stuff. And I was like, oh, I have done all this stuff. And it took somebody to reflect back how handsome I was, how um, cool I was, and how successful I was for me to actually realize, oh, I have done some stuff. I've just been focused on, on any, everything I haven't done. And because I accepted who I was and learned to, self-love didn't exist back then, um, learned to be okay with myself, something flipped. I started to attract somebody that I liked. I actually ended up with her and it was, uh, it was beautiful. So I had that one reference point. So when the, the loving lingam started to happen, so I accepted my, finally after all these years, 35 I was, um, I started to attract more women. And in the course, there was an option to become a tantric gigolo. So I was like, oh, I'm going to become a tantric gigolo straight away. <laughs> so I didn't do the course. I just like became a tantric gigolo, dressed as a unicorn, became a unicorn sex worker. I started charging my time for, for sex. And back then, I was making £350 as a art director in advertising for nine hours work, or I could do three hours work for 350 pounds. <laughs> I was like, I'll do both. <laughs> so I was even more richer. And I did both until I started getting more and more clients. And then naturally I just progressed into becoming full-time DACA. The job was incredible. And during this time, one of my clients started crying. And I was like, oh, I'm dressed as a unicorn, what's going on? I don't know how to handle this because I'm not a space holder, I'm not a therapist yet. I'm just a guy who found a great tool and was having great sex. <laughs> but like, when this tears happened, luckily for me, I, I just held her. I didn't like panic and go, oh, why are you crying? Why are you crying? I just held her and allowed the emotions to move through her. And we finished the session and I said goodbye. She, we had a beautiful ending and she needed those tears to come out during that session because she felt safety and trust and she was able to be vulnerable enough to release that because very often in sex, this performance, this performance anxiety, am I looking perfect? But in a space of Tantra, everything comes up. It's inevitable, especially when you start to activate your conscious cock. It does become a healing tool. Because all you're doing is being present. You're allowing all the stored up tension, all the performance of the woman, all the, am I good enough? Am I beautiful enough? Is my booze perky enough? Am I moving in the right way? Like, they ju it just dissolves because your level of presence allows them to be present. And it's like dance. When you're present with your dance partner, you, everything goes quiet. Um, Tantra is very much like in the film Soul where he's playing the piano and it goes all purple. Like that's what it becomes like. You do start to trip. Um, yesterday we had a DMT-like experience sober. So it's... It's a very powerful thing, especially activating your lingam, learning to love your lingam, accepting your lingam. You start to create a new story about your lingam. There's so many things that have happened to us throughout our time as men, and we've had to be these performers. We've had to have an, <clears throat> an erection on demand. And if we don't, it has nothing to do with us, it's her fault. So now she's really ugly. Now she hates herself and she thinks it's her problem when we just need a bit of time as well. We need a bit of safety as well. When it comes to utilizing my, my, my lingam for healing, um, as I have a conscious cock, 
I'm not doing the jackhammer and I'm not going in and out, in and out, in and out really fast. Like, I'm able to hold my lingam inside of a yoni and they're able to move around my lingam and I'm able to analyze the data in their body and then I match their movements. And I'm able to see how women actually move. Women do not move like this when they have sex at all. Men have never seen a woman really move like this. And I've been analyzing women for nine years and I, and, and I when I'm making love to my partners, I just keep my, when I'm inside of them, I give them permission to, to activate themselves on my lingam. So they will be gyrating their hips like this. I'm like, huh, interesting. Now I'm a guy and I'm trying to figure stuff out. When I move like this and move like them, it's fucking exhausting. It's really tiring. <laughs> like moving like this, easy because I've done that all my life. Like the first time I actually had sex sober was when I was 34, which is a long time. And when I became conscious and started to um, do Tantra, teach Tantra and become a sacred sexual Jedi, I, I started to observe women, observe martial arts, observe Thai yoga massage, um, studied the Kama Sutra, created the Shafti Sutra. I went really deep into all these healing arts, ecstatic arts, to help one another heal. Well, our key thing was actually to reach enlightenment. That, that, that was our goal. We just wanted to get into enlightened states through sex magic, through lovemaking, and we did. It turns out every single religion is created for you to reach enlightenment to, to find God, which is within inside of you. Every single religion is built for self-love. Um, every practice is the same. Um, I always talk about my mum having these beads and she uh, uses the words Allah, Allah, or Allahu, Allahu. Uh, when I discovered Hinduism and Tantra, it's mainly Tantra to be honest, it wasn't, I wasn't that into the Hindu, Hindu part, I was obsessed by Tantra. And I, I was obsessed by what can I get from this? <laughs> like, what can I manifest? And when I realized about Shiva to become more present so I could serve more women, uh, I learned the mantra, Om Namo Shiva, Om Namo Shiva, Om Namo Shiva. Uh, when I was running out of money, I uh, learned the mantra, Om Shri Mahalakshmi Enamaha. And when I realized if I masturbate to, to that mantra, more money comes, I was like, this is working very well. I wonder if I could keep on doing this. And then I created this whole... Um, community where we'd come together and make love as a community to Om Shri Mahalakshmi Enamaha at midnight so all of us would get wealthy <laughs> and we'd all give, give up that energy up to the divine, the ultimate offering, your sexual energy, your life force energy. So I spent seven years just finding a very powerful woman, uh, a DJ, and somebody who's good at writing copy. <laughs> and we will come together, live in houses, and build these love-based communities. We, we'd create a culture where we'd all speak the same language around boundaries and consent. We'll talk about the rules of engagement every time people connect. It was very fluid. It's gender fluid. It wasn't masculine, feminine. We never spoke about any of that stuff. We just, everyone was bisexual or bisexual. We were all monogamous and polyamorous. We were all everything without any judgment around how we were. I mean, in some cases I wasn't poly enough. So I would get judged. So in these spaces where there is no judgment, you're able to explore. And for seven years, we just played. There was no limitations. We kept our way, uh, kept out of society's eyes, no one would judge us, no one would say, that's a sex cult. Uh, we were just a, a, a big group of people making love, reaching enlightened states and having a really, really fun time, which is all documented on my YouTube channel. It's literally everything's there just to show people that sex isn't so, it doesn't have to be so loaded, it doesn't have to be so serious. Um, sex and dance are the same thing for me. So for me, it's, it's, I love dancing and I will dance with the hottest people. And 
if the dancer's a really good dancer, I'm just going to have a better dance. Um, if there's a sexual attraction to that dancer, then I, not only am I going to have a better dance, I might even find the love of my life. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. So my invitation to every Dhaka, every Dakini, everybody, is to just dance. Don't be afraid to love. When you're dancing with someone, you're not thinking, well, I sometimes do, is she, can she have my baby? Yeah, of course I do. So <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a non-attachment in the dance. You dance and you move on, and you dance with somebody else. I went through a phase where I would only dance with people I wanted to have sex with. I had to break through a lot of conditionings, and, and I did, in order for me to be able to dance with everybody, even to dance with men. And I was afraid of men. I was, whenever I would see a lingam, especially in these, in these uh, play parties, conscious orgies, these temple nights, I would physically feel sick. I, I would gag. I'd be like, mm. And I couldn't do it. But I keep my shit together and just like avoid, avoid, avoid. Because I hadn't accepted my own lingam. And when I did, I was able to be okay around them. I was like, oh, I don't have that visceral response of I'm actually going to vomit. That took one year's worth of work of going deep into this practice of learning to love your lingam, to activate my lingam. It took, it didn't take long to become multi-orgasmic because I was hungry. I wanted to learn how to ejaculate. I was jealous of women because they were multi-orgasmic and I wasn't. They were having these kundalini rises. They were having, they were being fucked open to God and I wasn't. It, they were getting tied up and having orgasms. I'm like, how is any of this possible? I want that level of pleasure. And that's one of the main reasons why I identified myself as a lesbian, because I, I wanted to be like them. I felt they were far superior than the men. That's, that's my core belief. And then I discovered and accepted my own body, finally, my own anatomy. And then I started having more orgasms than women. And then I got told by a gay guru that men are the only ones who are able to fully give with their nervous system, so they're fully in their masculine, their lingam, and are able to fully receive with their nervous system, so they could be more in their feminine through their ass, because our prostate is a, one of, you know, a pleasure spot. So I was like, interesting. So not only have I been on this journey to awaken my lingam, which I did, um, awaken my understanding around semen retention, which I mastered. And my ass journey, my anal journey has actually been like just as long. My ass journey is as long as my voice journey. Lingam stuff I figured out because I, I was every day activating it. My anal work was actually one of the most profound things I've done out of all of the trainings. And it was at that that first ever training, did I have my first um, anal orgasm. And then after that, I had, I was dating a lot of um, bikinis, priestesses, and doctors and therapists. And we would work on my ass. Now, I'm triple air. I had ADHD, depression, anxiety, stress. I had a lot of energy. Um, and I couldn't sleep, I was insomniac. And then I had my ass work done. And then all of a sudden I became grounded. Now the ass work stories are really long, so I won't go into it, but um, I became very grounded and she had two lovers, one's a doctor, one's a priestess, and she said, how do you, how do you feel? I'm like, I'm super chilled, Oof. We're really grounded. Now grounded for me sounds like, I didn't know what grounded was because I thought it was just being boring. <laughs> A week later, she asked how you did. I'm like, I'm still pretty chilled, actually. I'm like, I'm still pretty grounded. Three months later, after my visa's up in Thailand, I'm like, yeah, I'm still grounded. And I've been grounded ever since. <laughs> There's life before that anal dearming to life to where I am now. 
I didn't know what a relaxed nervous system was until I had my ass work done. That wasn't an option. Being grounded, boring, but now I understand the value of being grounded. In my training, one of uh, the gurus said, Shaf, you have this ability to go into the room and raise up the energy. Like, that was my job. I was a party fluffer. I was a unicorn. I'm really good at going anywhere and like, getting the crowd. Like, I, literally 100,000 people dancing in unison and having a great time. Like, I was a dancer for 20 years. It's, it's my thing. Easy. And he looked at me and he said, that's easy for you, but your biggest power is going to be when you walk into a room and you're going to have, be able to bring the energy room down and ground everybody in the room. Obviously, I had no concept of what that means because I've never felt it in my body. Now, that's my biggest ability. I could get anybody to do, to feel anything and get into any state. Luckily, I just want everyone to have a great time, to fall in love with themselves and find a love love or loves of their lives and that's why I go around the world getting this mantra of I love my life I love my body I love myself to as many people on the planet I believe that if I could change one person's inner monologue from I hate myself to I love myself and I get to save one person's life but change millions of people's lives and that, beca that all happened because I learned to love my lingam that whole I love my body part of my life I did not love my body. I was a scrawny little kid. Like, there's a family photo of my older brother, my sister, me, and my younger brother. Like, I was like the runt of the litter. I had really bad teeth, really skinny, sick all the time. Like, yeah, I was not who I am now. And it took a lot of work to get to where I am, a lot of therapy, a lot of inner work. And I learned to love my body. And through that, I learned to activate my body. And I'm still on my, my journey. I still, you know, get injured sometimes. And I still look at myself and go, wow, I was amazing, but I'm not amazing now. A little bit fat, a little bit not fat. But, you know, 43 years young, I'm doing okay. <laughs> not so bad. <sighs> so today, we're going to be going through, you're going to have that one-year journey in a few hours. You're going to go through the process that I went through in a day. And we're going to train you up in this powerful art form of being a Dakini, stepping into your feminine power, teaching you a few techniques on how to make any man multi-orgasmic and help any man overcome erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation. You'll have a lifetime's worth of training in just one day. And again, it's a, it's a method, it's a process. It's pretty much the same stuff that we did on you, but the other way around. It's, remember, we're more similar than we are different. It's exactly the same process. So we're gonna begin today and allow some space today for emotions to come up. It's gonna be a challenging day, but also it might not be. It might be a very liberating day. I wouldn't be the person I am today if I didn't accept, forgive, and learn to love my dick. And I've had miracles happen because of my lingam. To this day, for some reason, women, celibate women who've gone through sexual trauma want to have sex with me after years of being celibate because I make them feel safe. I've had sex magic rituals with beautiful women and straight after they found the love of their lives and got married and they thanked me. Or they couldn't get pregnant for a long time, and we had a session, found another love of Elias and got pregnant. My lingam allows women to feel safe, because my lingam isn't out to get anything. Just like conscious touch, my conscious cock is just there and present. And whatever comes up, comes up. And the fact that I don't ejaculate means I'm not masturbating in a woman's vagina for stress release. 
which is what a lot of men are doing. I know there's another level, which is reaching enlightened states, because literally all we did for seven years. And I always say, if you, if you haven't reached enlightenment and you're doing it over and over again, then you're clearly not doing the process right. <laughs> Yes, you could reach enlightened states through plant medicines. Try and do it sober. That's the ultimate goal. And this is why we do this work, because you're like, oh, it's possible. So day four begins, and we'll begin now. Oh, someone's saying, you've been so helpful on my journey. Thank you again. Please keep this video up.